Hi there. First off, I want to thank everybody for wishing me a happy birthday yesterday. I really appreciate it. 25 years old. It only comes once in a lifetime, just like every other birthday, I guess. But the time for taking breaks is over. It's back to another series. Today we have Saya no Uta. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I have no fucking clue what this visual novel is about. Somebody in my Discord told me to play it. I got interested, so we're playing it. Bing bada boom, we're here, done, snap, crackle, pop. Before this video starts, I would just like to say, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow me on Twitch, and join the Discord server. Best community on earth, no kizzy. Enough talk, let's get into the first episode of Saya no Uta. That's weird to say after saying you're trying to die so much. Enjoy. The journey begins. Let's go, let's get it started. The story is a work of fiction. The procedures and conditions described herein are imaginary and do not reflect actual medical practice. Okay, got it. Cool. Uh, 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 what? What is that? What is that? Ew! The wriggling mass of flesh burbles. Oh God! Okay, I'm already. Whoa! What? Oh, bro. Dog, what do they, oh, what do y'all have me playing? Three such creatures sit around the table in front of me, slurping filthy sludge from their cups as they trade whines, growls, and sounds that I cannot describe. Oh, bro, 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 bro. This, what is this sound? What is this sound? What they got me doing right now? What do y'all have me? What do y'all have me playing? What do y'all have me playing? For real, what is this? Whoa, what? Ew, what is this, bro? I'm not, no. Ugh. What the fuck is this? By listening carefully, I am able to grasp the gist of their conversation and respond when it is required of me. This is necessary to avoid arousing their suspicion. However, these creatures look, they are my friends, apparently. I wish that I could still deny it, but I gave up on that a long time ago. Night after night, I went to sleep praying for an end to this nightmare, only to wake each morning to the same twisted hellscape as the day before. Ew, I know now that I have to blend in, that I have to act like one of them. Such has been my life these past three months, and so it will remain until the day I die. Bro, please stop with this. Nah, I'm skipping, I'm skipping. Judging by its tone, this one must be... Fuck! Stop! Okay, this is actually horrible. Judging by its tone, this one must be Koji, and the one next to him squealing more than the others is probably Omi. Which means that the one next to me is Yo. Though I can no longer see any trace of her once attractive features, I try my best to ignore the rotten stench of excrement that issues from her quivering flesh. I just want y'all to know, y'all will pay for your crimes against humanity for making me play this shit. Everything has changed. Or almost everything. By some cruel trick of fate, my relationship to the world alone remains the same. As if an insane architect took the blueprints of my life and rebuilt it out of blood and gore. These monsters and I were part of the same college club. We studied together, ate together, we even went skiing together every winter break. Now these are but painful memories of days that will never return. If only no one recognized me, I might have been able to disconnect myself from the world. It would have been comforting in comparison to believe I had been abducted by aliens or that I had stumbled through a gateway to hell. But no, this is beyond a doubt the city where I was born and raised, the society that I was a part of for 20 years, save that I, and I alone, can no longer see it that way. The world as I knew it is gone. I have no place to call home. Oh. Okay. I am so interested 
and figuring out what the fuck happened here because this shit is terrible. This is terrible. Anyway, I can tell that whatever they're discussing is of no importance to me. I decide to keep quiet while pretending to listen. But just then... What the f- One of the flesh beasts says as it swivels his bloodshot eyes towards me. What do you think? About what? I try desperately to suppress my loathing and behave normally, but my hoarse voice runs- ruins the attempt. Uh, we were talking about this year's ski trip. You're coming too, right? With you, motherfucking weird beasts? A slimy hole near the top of the creature writhes nauseatingly as it vomits some semblance of words. That must be Koji's face. Or what I would have seen as such three months ago. Unable to stomach the sight of it, I avert my eyes and give a neutral answer. I don't know. You have other plans? Not really. These were my closest companions. One of them had even wished to be more. How many nights have I spent crying in loneliness, lamenting the friends who no longer exist? In three months, my tears ran dry, and now there is only loathing left in me, surrounded by hideous creatures that I can only assume are Koji, Omi, and Yo. I spend each day trying to act as I always have. If I fail at this, I'll surely be sent back to the hospital. Only this time will be walked away forever. No matter what, I won't let that happen. I mean, it's not like physical activity could affect your injuries, right? I'm not sure. I'll ask the doctor during my checkup. That's it. I can't look at them or bear their screeching anymore. I jump to my feet, desperate to escape. A spray of stringy slime from the cilia along his voice box flies at me. I try to cover myself, but too late to keep the slime from splattering across my face like the yolk of a rotten egg. I'm about to lose it. I want to grab a chair, a desk, anything within reach, and use it to smash the life out of this creature ending it all. I barely suppress the impulse. I mustn't let on that something... I mustn't let on that something is wrong. However they look to me, this is their world. I'm the outsider here. Like I said, today's the checkup. I have to go. Struggling to put on a smile, I reach into my wallet, pull out the first bill I find, and put it on the table without even looking at it. I don't care about the change. I just need to get out of here now. What type of shit are y'all paying for? Look at this background, bro. There's no way society is even like... There's no way society is still around. Look at this! Later, I mutter hastily and flee the cafeteria. There's no way society is real. I'm not crazy. Okay, what the fuck is going on? Why don't we go somewhere we can skate for this year's ski trip? To Tsukaba Yo. No, Tsukuba Yo frowns the suggestion. Skate? But why go to a ski resort to skate? Give her a break, Tsukuba. It's all she talks about these days. Tono Koji supports Omi with a laugh. Her impromptu suggestions are nothing new, and it's Koji's role as her boyfriend to provide backup. They're a good match for each other, Yo thinks. Sometimes it makes her jealous. I mean, she's seriously never gone skating before I took her the other day. Hey, is it really that strange? Not many people start skating in their 20s, you know. I was scared when I was little. Those shoes look like big knives. But you picked it up just like that? That's pretty amazing, Omi. It's a lock like skiing. You keep your way forward and use the angle of the shoes to steer. You made it sound so easy, I figured I should give it a try, and it was fun. So it was a date. Yo feels a stab of envy. Can y'all still hear this? I have it turned down, like, low. Because I'm talking over this shit, they don't need to... Koji and Omi enjoy their time together as normal lovers do. That's certainly not something that should make her jealous, it's just that her luck in love has been bad. Oh, well, I want to see Omi skate too. Yo keeps her voice upbeat, trying to cover up her disquiet. She knows that it's wrong to envy her friend, she too would be spending time with the man she admires, if not for the terrible tragedy that befell him. His is true misfortune, her bad luck doesn't begin to compare. So how about it? If we make the next ski trip a skating trip too, it'll be twice as fun. 
but you can skate as a skating rink, can't you? Why go all the way to a ski resort? I don't want to skate indoors. I want to skate outside on a lake or something. That sounds fun, but want to be crowded? While speaking, Yo sneaks a sideways glance at the young man sitting next to her. Although the conversation has involved only three people so far, there are in fact two couples at the cafeteria table. Yo's boyfriend, though there's still some doubt over whether he could be called that, is beside her, as silent as precious as a statue. Hey, Fuminori, what do you think? Oh, okay, is Broads so, so perhaps Koji sense Yo's pain in his usual quiet and considerate way? So is Bro just tripping? Is Bro just losing his fucking? Is he just losing his fucking mind? Like he's over there, like he's he's in his mind, he's over there fucking. Um, what is it? He's over there hallucinating that some shit has gone to absolute hell, but it's all normal. Look at him. About what? The cause of Yo's distress. Sak Saki Sas. Whoa, Saki Saka Fuminori responds to Koji's sudden query with a vague, mumbled question of his own. Um, we were talking about this winter ski trip. You're coming too, right? Koji speaks gingerly as though pro probing a tumor. A few months ago, he would not have hesitated to rebuke Fuminori for his attitude. Their long acquaintance had forged a strong, honest friendship. But now, I don't know. Fuminori responds bluntly, his downcast eyes and sullen demeanor making it clear that he has no desire to break his silence. You have plans? Not really. Even Koji, Fuminori's best friend, cannot communicate with him as before. What hope does Yo have of breaking through his shell? The scars left by the events of that late summer day are still deep all these months later. Each one of the four bears them, not only Fuminori. I mean, it's not like physical activity could affect your injuries, right? Not sure. I'll ask the doctor during my checkup. As though that answer drained the last of his patience, Fuminori bolts out of his chair. Even Koji can't keep his voice from rising as he tries to stop Fuminori from leaving. Fuminori reacts swiftly, throwing his hand over his face as though to shield himself from something terrifying. Maybe some spit flew inadvertently from Koji's mouth, but that happens sometimes. Fuminori's reaction is beyond the pale. Like I said, Fuori snaps, making no attempt to relieve the discomfort of his friends. Today's my checkup. I have to go. Even as he tosses money on the table to pay for his coffee, he acts like he's touching something filthy. Later. Funori stalks out of the cafeteria almost as if he's running away. Cloaked in heavy silence, the remaining three lower their gaze to the table where the abandoned 10,000 yen bill soys for and lonely. Funori's coffee is untouched. I can't take this anymore, homie says with a sigh, but Koji shakes his head reproachfully. Funori just needs a little more time. But it's been three months. What was his attitude? I feel like I'm going crazy hanging around him. Hey, I don't understand what he's going through either. I don't think any of us can. Can you imagine losing your whole family like that? That'd screw anyone up. It could have happened to anyone. A tractor trailer flipped over on the highway, crushing the Saki Saka family car into twisted scrap. They said it had been difficult to tell the body of Fuminori's parents apart. I'm sorry, what? What now? So, so his whole family just got fucking clapped by a tractor trailer. That's tough. For a while, it looked as, as if there was no hope for Fuminori either. It was nothing short of a miracle that he was able to leave the hospital and return to a normal life. He was the worst when we sent him in the hospital, remember? He was terrified of us, like he didn't know who we were. He even had to be tied to the bed. He freaked out so bad. I'm just glad he's made it this far. There's still something strange about him. What's with the way he looks at us? It's like we're not even human. Cut it out, Omi, Koji says forcefully, probably less out of empathy for his friend out than out of consideration for Yo. While Koji's kindness makes her happy, Yo also knows that she mustn't take advantage of it. Fuminori is the victim, just as Koji said. He's the one who most deserves sympathy. Yo's feelings for Fuminori are her problem and no one else's. She doesn't blame Fuminori for not giving her an answer after she worked up the courage to ask him out. In fact, she thinks even more fondly of him for taking the time to consider than she would have had he treated their relationship casually. Apparently, the fact that Fuminori did not reject her was enough to make them a couple in Koji and Omi's eyes. They've had plenty of fun at Yo and Fuminori's expense since. The truth of it, though, is that he still hasn't given her an answer. Yeah, because he thinks you're a fucking, like, massive blob of, like, disgusting, filth and, gut and like, guts. After revealing her feelings to him, Yo didn't see Fuminori again until a week later, and then she could only stare at his broken body through the window over the ICU.
And when he was finally released after 50 days that seemed an eternity, he was somehow different. She's starting to doubt that he even remembers what she confessed to him before the accident. Now winter is coming, and her feelings hang forgotten in the cold, lonely air. Dr. Tenbo Ryoko has never had a more troublesome patient. Any changes since your last visit? No, nothing to speak of. His voice is hard and flat, his words tossed carelessly into the air. It's like he's speaking to himself in an empty room. Ryoko is a surgeon, not a psychiatrist, but even she can sense the thickness of the wall he has erected between himself and the world. Any nausea, dizziness, or hallucinations? No. While Sakisaka appears... I'm just going to call him Saki from now on. While Saki appears to be looking at Ryoko, his gaze is actually aimed at a fraction aimed a fraction down to the side. He's only superficially engaged in the conversation when in truth it does not interest him in the slightest. Perfect rejection. Realizing that she can't interview him like this, Ryoko sighs and sets her chart aside. Mr. Saki, the procedure you received at this hospital was the latest in experimental neurosurgery. We explained this before, didn't we? Treatment of subdural hematoma hematoma through the use of micro machines a procedure available in japan exclusively here at t university had been the only way to save saki fuminori from a cerebral contusion that should have been fatal with any experimental treatment there is always the risk of unexpected complications what like him seeing the entire world as if it's fucking resident evil 9 that shit was disgusting bro if we have to go back to that shit again i might turn this game off of course Saki Saka Fuminori's lips twist slightly in what might be a bitter. Wait, what? I just left clicked and got a whole bunch of shit. Autoplay. Foot. Okay, cool. Sick. Saki Fuminori's lips twist slightly in what might be a bitter or mocking smile, but it is gone before Ryoto can discern its meaning. Normally, I would never say anything to frighten a patient. But there have been reports of serious neurological disorders post-surgery. We must continue to monitor your condition carefully. Yeah, uh, he's got he's got it, bro. Whatever, whatever, whatever neurological disorder you're talking about, he's got that shit. Hence these weekly checkups. If only he would take them a little more seriously. How was last week's MRI? Saki asked abruptly, as if to catch Ryoko off guard. MRI, magnetic, res magnetic resonance imaging, is a way for doctors to examine the brain in detail without opening the patient's skull. Surprised by Saki's uncommon technical knowledge, Ryoko recalls his profile. Oh, that's right. You're a medical student, aren't you? The kind of anomaly you're worried about should show up on the MRI, right? Did you find anything? No. There was nothing, not the slightest hint of abnormal activity. For a procedure with such a low rate of success, the results have been nothing short of miraculous. However, something still bothers Ryoko. She can't shake the feeling that he's hiding something beneath his guarded exterior, something terrible weight on his soul, perhaps. But if it's an inorganic problem, then there's nothing she can do as long as he refuses to explain it. I'm fine. I've been on my own for three months without any problems. What could go wrong now? Please, you know that continued observation is required after these difficult surgeries. You have to trust us a little more. I suppose you're right. I do want to trust you, doctor. Can I come to you with anything? Yes, of course, Ryoka answers, smiling to cover up her irritation. Saki asked exactly the same question during last week's visit. Well, then let's pick up where we left off. Have you learned anything about Dr. Ogai? Unable to answer, Ryoko hardens the mass of her smile. As before, the patient is inquiring about someone who he has no business knowing. If you don't mind my asking, what does Dr. Ogai have to do with your treatment? You just told me to trust you, and now you're keeping secrets. Ryoko is used to patients treating her with hostility. Some degree of paranoia is natural when dealing with a person whose mistakes could kill you. In Saki, however, she doesn't see the anxiety that other patients exhibit. His demeanor is perfectly calm, almost like a detective questioning a suspect. He left this hospital some time ago. I never had any contact with him myself. Do you know why he left? Hold on. I believe it's personal, Ryoko answers smoothly. Her earlier hesitation, gone, no. I, I gotta I gotta stay back stay back right here having decided at the outset to lie she has no trouble doing so with a straight face but why do you keep asking about Dr. Ogai are you acquainted did you know that the doctor has gone missing no Ryoka realizes that her answer may have been a little too quick she should have acted more surprised I've recently become close with a relative of his it was she who asked me to find him a relative Ryoka considers this with a frown I didn't think I, Dr. Ogai had any relatives. Oh, who told you that? I 
heard it from a nurse, Ryoko replies, remembering that she just claimed to have had no contact with the man. I see. The doctor was famous enough to have nurses gossiping about him. I hear he was an unusual man. But no one knows why he left the university. Ryoko falls silent, knowing that this isn't a topic she could brush away with a smile. Saki seems to have finally grasped her mood, however, as his strangely stiff tone softens a little. Please, I have to find Dr. Ogai. There's a girl who needs him, can't you help me? Isn't this something the police should handle? Although she makes it sound like the most obvious thing in the world, the suggestion is actually a gamble. If Ogai Masahiko's disappearance... Ooh, I said that shit perfectly. If Ogai Masahiko's disappearance becomes a police matter, then the university will be investigated. Everyone who is involved in the incident will be at risk of exposure. My back hurts. And of course, that includes Ryoko herself. She knows, however, that Saki is unlikely to go to the police. First of all, his excuse is obviously a lie. They already made sure that Ogai had no relatives who might come looking for him, which is why they could bury the truth of what happened. But then how does Saki, a mere patient, learn about Ogai? I'd be happy to help, but there's been no word from Dr. Ogai since he resigned last April. I can only assume that he's gone on an extended vacation. I see. Expecting resistance, Ryoko is surprised when Saki backs down. She's still worried about his condition, and the mysterious link between him and Ogai is only making her more uneasy. But as long as he doesn't open up to her, there's nothing she can do. After a brief pause, Ryoko writes progress good on Saki's chart for today. About next week's appointment, how about how does four o'clock again sound? Before she can finish, Saki is gone. Don't put me through that conversation. Oh God, what the f It looks like someone sprayed the walls with pig guts from ceiling to floor. What color should the walls of a hospital be? White, of course, and the creatures of rotten flesh shambling around me. I'm sure this hallway looks just as white as it should. I know intellectually that the walls are white. I know that the flesh beasts are really human. I'm the one with the problem. It's because I've accepted this that I'm able to lead something approaching a normal life. Even if my university medical department is nowhere near as good as T universities, I'm still a medical student specializing in neurology. I have a basic of idea of what has happened to me, though it's hard to believe. This isn't a pathological condition. It's probably some form of agnosia, unlike anything that has ever been studied before. The flesh beast called Tenbo Ryoko said that other patients had developed neurological disorders after receiving the same treatment. I, wow, I did not say that sentence at all. Let me try that again. The flesh beast called Tenbo. The flesh beast called Tenbo Ryoko said that other patients had developed neurological disorders after receiving the same treatment I did. So I guess I'm just another failure. It makes me want to laugh and then know what all doctors face. That said, I don't blame the doctors who operated on me. After all, I do all them my life. I know as well as anyone how low the chance of success was and that I had no other hope for survival. I was unlucky. That's all there is to it. The point is that my condition isn't treatable. Just like someone adapting to a hearing aid or a wheelchair, I have no choice but to adapt to this nauseating scenery. Of course it's hard. It wasn't easy to resign myself to this fate. But now there's more than just despair. Even for me, there is a glimmer of hope. Keeping my eyes on my feet, I hurry home. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood in a house that's much too large for me alone. My parents, even unluckier than I was, died in the accident three months ago. I couldn't even go to their funeral for being in intensive care. I had to sell my father's business, but at least that left me with the house and enough money to live on for a while. Of course I'm sad, but the accident took more f from me than my parents. In fact, being on my own has probably saved me. If they were still alive, my parents would never have allowed me to live with some strange girl. What? Welcome home. As I open the door, a bright voice greets me from the kitchen. The voice is beautiful and clear as a bell. Human. Its sweet sound washes the day's cacophony from my memory. I'm home, Saya. Even the patter of feet coming down the hallway is music to my ears. Nowhere else in the city can I hear such footsteps. Only in this house with Saya am I so privileged. You're late. I was a little worried. Who the fuck is this? Sorry, I had to stop by the hospital today. Oh, that was today? And her smile is in the inquisitive tilt of her head is everything that I have lost. 
Since my accident, this girl is the only person I've met, perhaps the only person in the entire world, who does not trigger my cognitive disorder. True, her skin seems too white and the color of her eyes and hair is probably different in reality, but even so, her form is undeniably human. And it's not just her appearance and her voice either. As I bend down to take off my shoes, Saya wraps her arms around my neck and pulls me gently into her tiny bosom. Her skin feels truly human, not cold or slimy, and from her hair wafts a sweet feminine fragrance. In all the world, only Saya is pleasing to my five senses. And what's more, she smiles at me, embraces me. She knows that she is my salvation and for some reason is happy that I need her. If I had not met Saya, if I had been all alone in this twisted, filth-ridden world, I would no doubt have succumbed to madness. It's no exaggeration to say that Saya alone is keeping me alive. What did you do today? Worked on the living room, the painting's half done, and now I'm making your dinner like I learned from TV. Sounds good. I'll take a little longer, can you wait? Sure, I'll do some more work in the living room. After I see the humming Saya off to the kitchen, I step into the living room. I realized one day, I realized one day that if the natural colors of the world were sickening, all I had to do was paint over them with colors that seemed pleasant. I went to the hardware store and bought every color of paint I could find, then Saya and I tried different combinations until we found one that worked. After painting the bedroom from ceiling to floor, I was finally able to get my first good night's sleep since the accident. When we first started on the living room, Saya, unsure what to do with the curtains, just painted carefully around the windows. Without a moment's hesitation, I tore the curtains down and painted over the glass itself. There'll never be anything out there that I'd want to see, and as long as we keep the storm shutters closed, the neighbors probably won't think anything of it. Dinner's ready. Can you bring it in here? As she enters the living room with a tray of food, Saya sniffs the air. The paint smells doesn't bother you? Now that she mentions it, I suppose the smell of paint thinner must be building up in this closed room. It doesn't really bother me though. There are far worse smells outside. Does it bother you? No, I'm fine if you are. Saya sets the food on the table. Unfortunately, neither its color nor its smell is at all appetizing. Not that food elsewhere is any different. Thanks, Saya. As become routine, I steal myself and methodically transport the food into my mouth. The taste is as gut-wrenchy as I expected, but it's not Saya's fault. I'm sure she's made it exactly like the cooking show said, it's just that my taste buds can't accept it. It's not good, she asks hesitantly. Well, no. Lying won't make Saya happy, she knows about my condition. Don't worry about it, I'll make something different tomorrow. Sorry, you always go into the trouble of cooking, but I... It's fine. If I keep trying, maybe I'll find something you like. In my current state, eating is nothing more than an unwelcome duty. As much as I hate it, I need food to survive. If I stay alive, then perhaps one day, as Sai says, I'll be able to taste something delicious again. I met Sai, didn't I? Aren't you going to eat? No, I already ate. In all the time we've been together, Sai has never once eaten with me. I don't know why she refuses to do so. It makes me a little sad. Still, I'm not about to push the issue, not when she's putting up with all the problems I have. By the way, I asked about your father again. You did? Dr. Ogai Masahiko is Saya's father and her only living relative. Saya has asked me to unravel the mystery of his disappearance. They still wouldn't tell me anything. I get the feeling they're hiding something. Oh. I expected Saya to be a little more disappointed. You haven't given up, have you? No. Saya responds with an unreadable expression. It's not that. She gives a little shake of her head, then smiles at me once again. Thanks for all you're doing for me. It's nothing compared to what you've done for me. I thank her for the meal and set my chopsticks down next to the perfectly clean plate. As wretched as the taste was, thinking of the care that Saya put into it, gave me the strength to finish every bite. Is it bath time? Yeah. Will you wash my back again? Sure. Ever since I moved in, it's been like having my own wife. Bro's life is actually terrible, bro. Like, that is a GG. Like, bro is actually living in some fucking hellacious shit. Ain't no way, bro. I would have I would have offed myself. I would have unalived. I would have unalived. I want to, un bro, I would have rage quit life. There's no way, bro. Saya, why are you so good to me? C 
team came out and okay so i made a mistake um i forgot i downloaded the uncensored version so um yeah <laughs> um y'all remember you and me and her right so we're doing it again it's back we're just gonna continue i guess you can hear the sounds i guess Size Slender's hips bounce up and down with an insatiable hunger, each descent thrusting my manhood deep into the embrace of her hot, tight womb. Oh no, I don't want to read this. Ah, okay, 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 okay. I made, I made, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Is this merely sympathy? Do you pity me, the exile from society? Is that enough for you to surrender yourself from such mad desire? Are you so wanton? No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. Her eyes, as she gazes down upon me, are devoid of twisted or sinful desire. They're only the melting flames of ecstasy. Her beautiful. No, <laughs> I'm not reading this. I'm good. Oh, it's even worse. Needing to reassure myself that she's real, I raise my hands. Oh, okay. I gotta just I just gotta scream. Ah. 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 Okay. What is going on? Bro. Saya collapses atop me, still smiling, and I wrap my arms around her. The feeling of her soft, sweat-soaked skin and the warmth emanating from her body reassure me that she is still here. Are you crying? I realize that my cheeks are wet with tears. Why, Saya? Why do you go so far from me? Fuminori. I don't understand it. I don't, but I'm losing myself to you more every day. I can't live without you, Saya. I wrap my arms tighter around her, praying that our bodies will melt together and never again be apart. Tell me, please, what must I do to keep you with me? How can I repay you? No, 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 no. Keep holding me, Sire whispers into my chest. I want you to make love. No. I won't leave you, Fuminori. Why? Why me? Because you're all alone, she says softly, gazing up into my eyes. All alone, just like me. The sorrow in her voice resonates with my own. There is a deep loneliness in her eyes, a loneliness from which now springs boundless affection. You're all I have. In the whole wide world, only you will embrace me, my precious Fuminori. Now I know. No matter what horrors this world unleash upon me, all I'll never need is Saya. This girl better be real, bro. I think we're good. I think we're straight. I th Oh, God. <laughs> I can't deal with this game. Yo is determined to talk to him today. I, I no, no, nah, I'm saving. No, nah, this is a save. 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 I'm good, bro. I gotta just, I just gotta save, bro. I just gotta save. Saving this slot. Okay, get me out of here. Get me out of here. That's enough. That that honestly just drained all of my, that drained all of my energy. I have nothing left. I have nothing left to play with right now, so I'm just, I'm just not gonna try it. I'm good. I'm straight. <laughs> I'm straight, bro. I'm absolutely straight. Holy fuck! What an intro to this game, bro. I honestly did not expect it to take the turn that it took at the very end of that. Um, but I should have expected more because this is a Nitro Plus game, and Nitro Plus be doing some wild shit. So, I don't know why I didn't see that coming. If you guys like this video, please make sure to leave a like down below. Comment, let me know what you think so far of Saya no Uta. Shit crazy. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow me on Twitch, and join the Discord server. Best community on Earth. Those links and all my other social media links will be in the description down below. Go check me out. I'd really appreciate it. That's been it. I'm glad to have started this new journey with you guys. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, we move. I'll see you soon.